I'm able to pull it over. It's fine. Okay, it, it worked. We've got just a few minutes to let some people get here. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. That one works fine. Yeah. We didn't get it on the Sunday. Hey, Boo Bear. Come on. Come on, look at it like this if we get down. No, we brought it. Where's your breakfast? Yeah. 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 Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning I am so glad to see all of you here this morning. And uh, if you don't know, I'm Pastor Katie. And my husband is reminding me to turn on the lavalier mic. Is that a little better? I can hear something. Yep. All right. So we have some opportunity. Well, before we do that. I told you how glad I was that you were all here, but I invite you to turn your, to your neighbor and tell them how glad you are that they are here and remind them that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Good morning. Good morning. So, for our new 
have friends who are coming. You don't want to miss that little bookshelf by the back. There's little bags with goodies in it to occupy uh, our smaller friends. So um, just want to make sure you guys don't miss those. And uh, we have a couple things. First, today is the last day of the women's rummage sale. Yay! <laughs> is that a yay for how awesome it's been or a yay for, oh my gosh, we're already finally done? Yes. Finally done. Yes, all of the above for all the hard workers who've done this hard work to raise money for missions. And if you don't know, 100% of the money that is raised from this rummage sale goes right back into the community to charities in our community that help women and children. Um, and then Rita, did you want to give a little update of where we're at? Well, we just went a smidge over 7,000. Oh my God. So in the last couple days, we went a smidge over 7,000. And so that is amazing and great. And great. Thanks to a lot of people who did a lot of hard work, not just this weekend, but in all the weeks leading up. Um, so that is great. And I am sure all of our uh, food pantries and the Women's Resource Center and Moms and Tots and all the other places that the women support um, are going to be appreciative of all that hard work. Also, uh, I saw some donations out there for the Little Free Pantry, but if you want to bring some more, you can even just put them right in the pantry if it's looking a little empty. Um, and also, Tuesday, August 30th, we have another blood drive in the basement. Uh, so I encourage you, I know there's some people who can't give, but if you can give I encourage you to come and share with your friends and neighbors that we're going to have a blood drive and they can sign up on the Versity website. Um, also, I have another kind of fun thing. Kuwait and United Methodist Church is having a concert next Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, there is going to be refreshments afterward and I'm told there is a love offering which... Uh, locally. All right, there are zucchini and cucumbers on the back table. You know, this is the time of year that all Michiganders lock their doors so they don't have tomatoes and zucchinis stuck in their car. But uh, as someone who did not grow zucchini this year, I am thankful for those. So it's a great thing to share all that God has given us. Well, that's a great model for stewardship that we're talking about, right? Uh, yes, ma'am? There's veterans dinner for veterans and their families. Oh, yes. Free as part of the tournament this Thursday, starting at 5, I think it is. And also, they, they have smoke detectors for anyone that's in need. And in our worship with our opening hymn, Here I Am to Worship. Please rise if you are able.
You will join with me in our call to worship. Forth from the heavens. Earth below receives the. Best way to serve God. By serving and caring for. Ready for great service in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and it's time for the children to come forward. Come on up, guys. I promise I don't bite, or at least not very hard. <laughs> so today, our, our scripture from the Bible, the story we're going to read from the Bible, it's about that as the body of Christ, as Jesus' people, that we are like the parts of the body, that, that what parts of your body do you have? Who has a nose? Everybody? What does it help yeah. you to do? To smell. It's really important to have a nose, right? It helps you breathe, too. Yeah? And what about your eyes? They help you see. They help you see. They do. And what about your mouth? They help you talk. It helps you talk. It helps you taste. What? And breathe, it does help you breathe. And for snakes, it helps them smell. And for snakes, it helps them smell. There's a smart cookie right there, right? What about your toes? What do your toes help you do? Walk. Walk? Does everybody have toes? Yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> what about your elbow? What does your elbow help you do? Not really anything. Well, what would it be like if we walked around like this? Could you scratch your nose? Get it first, right? What about your to check? Everybody's got a belly button. So let's check. Do all the grown-ups out there have a belly button? No, yeah. yeah. Do you know what it did before you were born? No, it was attached to your mommy and it helped you to get oxygen because you couldn't breathe because you were inside her belly, right? Yeah. Yeah, so a, a belly button is a pretty important thing even though we think it's kind of silly and it doesn't have a purpose, right? What about your big toenail? Um, I stumped you, huh? I'm pretty sure there's a reason for your big toenail, right? Yeah, maybe it helps you balance a little bit with your toes and your feet. Or maybe it's... It protects your toes. There's another smart cookie, right? But every part of our body is important, right? 
They all have a purpose, even like your nose hairs. They help filter all the air, right? Yeah? Did you know you have hairs in your nose? No? Once you get older, you'll know you have hairs in your nose. Am I right, gentlemen? So every part of your body is important, and that's what we're being told in, in our scripture we're going to read later, is that every person who's part of Christ's body is important, and sometimes we think we're not. We don't have a lot to give. about it, talking about jigsaw puzzles, which is our, our kind of theme for stewardship. So what we do, um, and this is wonderful to have such a big group, let's go down on the ground down there, and what we like to do is we make a circle, and we like to say the prayer that Jesus taught us, and if you're a bigger person who can read, if you're a bigger kid who can read, you might want to be on this side of the circle, because the words are going to be up on the screen, Okay. So let's hold hands, and if you are a littler person who maybe doesn't read and doesn't know the prayer Jesus taught us, you can listen along, and you can maybe start to learn the prayer, okay? Yeah. All right, so do you know at the beginning whose father? Our Jesus? father. Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You guys may go to your seats. are on your hearts this morning. I have one already. Radio stress test coming up Monday uh, the 15th. So we are going to keep Al in our prayers that everything goes well with this stress test and uh, that things will check out well. Lord, in your mercy, what other prayers and praises are on your hearts? Continuing for Elena. Continued prayers for Elena as uh, she's having some testing to figure out where things are going next for her treatments. And so we pray for good news from her tests, but also that even as there's this little pause that God is at work healing her body and Reproducing the good cells and getting rid of the cancer cells. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? I'd like to thank everybody for the cards and the telephone calls and the prayers helping me get through. So prayers of thanksgiving for this tender time that you were in, that your church family has lifted you up and prayed and uh, been there. And we pray that we would be for you in the coming weeks and months and years as you miss your love. Lord, in your mercy. Scott? Just praise for uh, church helping us go to family camp. They helped part of the reason we you know, get to go, and we had a blast, and it was great. So. Yeah. yeah, lots of thanksgiving the Wagner family for this time away to go to clergy family camp. And you'll hear about it in the sermon in a little bit, but... Uh, it was a really, um, just kind of it helps build me back up so I can do this for another year and uh, got to be with a lot of my clergy colleagues that we haven't seen a lot because of COVID and um, got some good ideas from people and so we are thankful for that. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Tina? 
I have a praise, a joy. With us today are my cousins, Steve and Linda Ozan, and uh, I'm just so happy to have them here with us today. So we are glad too, although we, we get taught we're not supposed to call out guests in worship, but uh, I suppose since you're family, you're allowed to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still joyful. them being here to visit. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And we thank the Lord that you two had a nice anniversary of 32 years. Yeah. yeah, I thank God for 32 years with Scott, because... Actual witness for all of us who come behind you and don't have quite that many years, and so may your years be blessed together, Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers and praises are in your hearts? If there are no other prayers to be spoken aloud, let us go to God in silent prayer, knowing that God knows all that's on our hearts and in our minds. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for all the good things in our life and in our world. God, even as some of us grumble a bit, we give thanks to you for the rain after a very dry summer. We give thanks to you for each person who is here in worship, each person who is at work in our church doing your work out in the world, all of the parts of your body. And God, we lift up to you in prayer all those people we have named this morning, those who are in need of your healing and your loving presence in hard times. God, we also lift up to you our neighbors in Kentucky and all the places around there that are flooded. We lift up to you those who are grieving the loss of loved ones to the flooding. Safety for those first responders who are out there doing the hard work. And safety for all those who are struggling with the massive flooding. We lift up to you, the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace, not only in Ukraine, but all over the world, all the places where there is war, where there is hate. God, we pray that you would be sowing your peace and your love and your justice. We pray for all those in our world who are in need of your touch, places and people who we might be the ones to help answer prayers. Those who are hungry, those who are unhoused, those who are struggling with mental health and addiction. God, we pray that we might be a part of the body who might help all of them in tangible ways, that we might be your hands and feet in the world. And God, we pray for our country. We pray about how divisive it is, how we've forgotten how we are each beloved and created in your image, that each person we meet bears the face of God. And so I pray for our country to come together to care for all the important things. And I pray your wisdom for all of our leaders. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it is time for our prayer response, which is number 2025 in the Faith We Sing hymnal, where the words are on the screen. If you would rise, if you are able. <laughs>
Our scripture lesson is from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. For that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So how many of you here do puzzles? Oh, a lot of you. I know some of you do. I didn't know this many of you did. But I have to say, I've always loved you know, on tests and stuff. When I was growing up, my mom had a crossword puzzles and uh, find a word puzzles. It had like a lot more complicated and interesting puzzles in it. And I would go after her, and I would do all the puzzles that she couldn't do, which uh, kind of chagrined my mom a little bit. And jigsaw puzzle making, that was something in our family that was saved for vacation, because else, right? And uh, so we would have jigsaw puzzles when we would go camping, and it would be out on the table, and usually we'd start a big one as a family, and we'd all Also drive yourself a little crazy finding the right piece. And some people I a picture to help you along. And sometimes as a kid, I would be up a little bit late bargaining with my parents saying, well, I'll go to bed if I just get one more piece or once I finish this section, right? It was my way of getting out of going to bed. But the part that I love about puzzle making is the fact that it takes every piece to complete the picture. How many of you have completed a puzzle and had one piece missing? You cut it everywhere for that silly one piece that you can't find because it's not complete without that last piece. Because every piece is important, every piece has its own gift to share. Some of the pieces have straight edges and make the outside of the puzzle, which we already established a couple weeks ago. You are all not monsters. You all do the edges first, right? I, I can't even wrap my brain around somebody who does not do all the edges of the puzzle first. It's just kind of, it's, it's just wrong, right? <laughs> and so others, um, Sometimes they help to spell things out in the puzzle. The puzzle we have up here is one that there's a murder mystery after you solve it, and then you got to 
figure out what happened, and some puzzles have special pieces. So maybe if it's a picture of birds, some of the pieces will be in the shape of a bird instead of a jigsaw puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these details in jigsaw puzzles. And some come together to make these incredible pictures, so much so that you see people with jigsaw puzzles framed on their walls because they're so neat. Every part and every piece of the puzzle is important. And we have been dreaming of new ways to be the church in the world, and we have been thinking about this awesome responsibility that was given to the early followers of Jesus to start and build the Christian church. It had to be overwhelming for these people because they had this huge emotional roller coaster, right? After Jesus died and they thought all this great stuff that he had told them about wasn't going to happen, and then he rose again, and then it was all on them, right? They didn't have their leader, their charismatic guy, to show them the way to go. There was no structure in place. There was no model for early disciples to follow. There was no church training for church growth for these early disciples of Jesus. And the New Testament hadn't even been written yet. There was no structure in place, and nothing had been discussed as to what the church should resemble or be. It was wide open. Jesus simply told his disciples before he left them and ascended into heaven, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So their job as the church was to witness, which is a word that we're not really comfortable with here at all, the United Methodist Church. Am I right? <laughs> I think those nervous giggles means yes, right? We aren't real comfortable with that word witness like maybe some other people are in more evangelical churches. But what that really just meant was it was their job to tell the story of Jesus. That sounds a little less threatening than witnessing, doesn't it? And to tell others exactly what they had seen and heard and experienced. And that's exactly what they did. Now, did they all tell the exact same story? No. No. We we have multiple books, in, you know, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John, that uh, they tell the same story in each of those books, but it's always slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. They told the stories of their experiences and the stories they had been told by others. And did they immediately build a building hoping people would come and listen to their stories on Sunday morning? Nope. nope. They told their stories to people they met on the road and in the town square. And, you know, John Wesley is our, the founder of Methodism. He's pretty famous for the same thing. He stood on his father's coffin to preach when they kicked him out of the church. And so they told their stories to anybody they met. They shared stories over dinner, and they worked to help others. And when they told their stories, they showed hospitality, and reached out to those who needed it. So they not only witnessed and preached about the good news, but they taught it by the example of their everyday actions. And little by little, the church began to sprout and grow as the disciples traveled and they shared the good news of Jesus in their words and their deeds with other people. You know, folks, it was a messy start. And to be honest, the road has never been completely clear and straight and narrow for the church and who we are and what we should be and become. It's still messy today because as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to understand about that the church is not a building. You remember the cartoon I put up with the town square and it had churches here and here and here, the guy on the bike, the person going into the coffee shop. Church is wherever we are, right? And it's not about a denomination or a name or a particular preacher or a set of rules. The church is about the followers of Jesus, the stories that we share, the things that we do, and the way that we teach others by our own example. Now, I shared with 
with you last week just a small taste of what I and you get out of our family going to clergy camp. And this past week at clergy camp, in the clergy session, because we have continuing ed as part of it, while we were introducing ourselves, we were going around and, you know, telling our name and where we were at and about our churches. And last year got into a, tell us about your park, church parking lot, which was really interesting. This one devolved into, tell us about your closest target, because those of us who don't have a close target were a little jealous of those in the city who had three targets close to where they lived in their churches. But while we were there, one of my clergy friends described her church by saying, my church believes that their best days are behind them and they have stopped dreaming big dreams. Mm -hmm. Now, I got goosebumps when I heard it. I got goosebumps when I just read it to you because it stopped me in my tracks because she named what I've been feeling from a lot of you. And honestly, it breaks my heart. One, because it's terrible stewardship. We're talking about stewardship right now and about us taking care of the things of God and the good news and the church and who we are as a church. That's one of the things we should be stewarding. We all have been given an incredible gift as a piece of the puzzle or as a part of the body. And the most important one is the good news of Christ that we have been given and in our faith in God. But also, I don't think it's true. I mean, I suppose it could be true if you make it true. But if you're going to do that, why not just dig a six foot rectangular or six feet deep rectangular hole and go lay in it till Jesus takes you home? Right? I don't think our best days at all in United Methodist Church are behind them. I think God has work for us to do and a future for us. Remember a few weeks ago at the beginning of this when I talked about the new normal and I said, what if God has something better in store than normal? What if by trying to go back to normal and how we think things used to be, we don't allow space for God to be at work in and through us and in our church. <clears throat> you know, there's a very smart theologian who I love her stuff. Uh, her name is Phyllis Tickle. And I, maybe I just love her because I love her name. Isn't that a great name, Phyllis Tickle? <laughs> she said that historically the church cleans house roughly every 500 years, holding what she calls a giant rummage sale. We can get into that, right? We have two giant rummage sales right here at the church. And we do great things with the proceeds from those rummage sales. And the church, when having these every 500-year giant rummage sales, they decide what to dispose of and what to keep, making room for new things. So looking back over the past 2,000 or so years, the time of Christ was the first rummage sale, an era that... Tickle calls the great transformation when Jesus, this man who was Emmanuel or God with us, created a new understanding of our relationship with God. And 500 years later, it saw the collapse of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Dark Ages. And in this period, the church entered an era of preservation as the church went underground with monks and nuns practicing monastic tradition in abbeys and convents and priories. And the next one was at the beginning of the next millennium in 1054. That was the Great Schism, it's called, when the Christian church split into the Eastern and Western branches, and we still see that today in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic churches. And then in the 1500s, do you know what happened then? Yes. The Protestant Reformation, it resulted in new branches of Christian tradition with different understandings of how people relate to each other and how they relate to God personally through direct prayer and individual interpretation of the Bible. And the kind of interesting thing is at least the last two have synced up with great changes in how we communicate. In the, the Protestant Reformation, we had our friend Gutenberg and the printing press, and they could print Bibles so that everybody could have one. 
Now we have a little bit of a transformation in communication, right? With the internet and computers and all of that. Um, and the interesting thing, too, is there's biblical scholars who say, oh, this just doesn't go back 2,000 years. You can track in the Jewish tradition about every five years, they kind of have a big thing that happens that changes how they do their religious practice. And so every 500 years or so, Tickle says, there were these tectonic shifts in the Christian tradition that resulted in huge changes of both understanding and of practice. And it's been about 500 years or so since the Reformation. Is the church ready for its next giant rummage sale? Are we already holding it? Are we already kind of scrambling around how we do church and what we do and what we think about God? You know, I think we are. I think it's pretty easy to just even identify the changes in the last century. Our understanding of science has progressed exponentially, forcing us to reconcile scientific and one or two sermon series ago, remember? I was up here telling you about quantum physics and God, right? It was lots of fun. You never knew you were so smart to understand quantum physics from a five-minute description. But we are culturally more diverse, we're living longer, our family units take a variety of forms, we're a global community no longer confined to the boundaries of our physical neighborhoods. You know, it used to be at the turn of the century, I had an old guy. by horse and buggy to go light the gas lights at church before church started. We've had a little bit of change in the church even since the beginning of this last century, right? And we have access to facts and data and opinions and information instantly through our computers we keep in our pockets. I just saw, and I don't even remember where I saw it, they had a Radio Shack ad with all this cool stuff from the 80s. The person said, you realize everything in this Radio Shack ad is on your phone, mm -hmm. right? Communication and access to news is immediate and unfiltered, and we could all have a big debate over whether that's good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. But our minds are changing for better or for worse for the way we process information. Now, how could these things not alter how we understand who we are and why we exist and where God is in our lives. And I hope, gosh, I hope, that nobody here checks their brain at the back of the sanctuary door when it comes to bringing all these things together. I think you can believe in science and believe in God, and they're kind of like a thumb and finger that work together. Between them, we can hold everything, right? They're not opposed to each other. <clears throat> and so I see how the church has changed just in my lifetime. And I want to think that I'm not that old, but I realize that I am a little bit old. But as a child, the church was the center of most families' lives, religious and social. Everybody went to church on Sunday mornings and often evenings, too. All the businesses were closed on Sunday. But compare that today with our church attendance or even affiliation, it's not the norm anymore. And yet, people who identify as spiritual but not religious, they're on the rise. God is still important, but identifying with a particular religion is not necessarily so. Phyllis Tickle says, we are entering a new era of the emergent church, which she wrote this a little bit ago, so I think we're already there which is a religious movement, movement that crosses denominational boundaries, seats common ground, engages diverse cultures, embraces social causes as ways to live out Christ's call to serve others, and takes place largely outside of church buildings. Is this the church of the future? As somebody who loves my church and my churches, my its people, its traditions, its liturgy, and yes, I love these buildings we have here because we have pretty great buildings. I admit that that change is really hard, and yet I know that God is calling us to be bigger.
this denomination. And then Scott and I just had a class on how to drive an ambulance, which they're very similar classes. But when we did our driving test, which involved cones and very large vehicles, um, one of them is to go backwards with just a couple inches on each side with cones, and you're oh not my. supposed to run over. And Ronnie has had this too. Ronnie can drive a fire truck like a rock star. Scott and I, not so much. But when I was doing it, I was trying to adjust in this very narrow aisle of cones. And my chief, knowing that I was still a beginning fire truck driver, said, look at the last cone, make the long view. And when I made the long view, guess what? I got really straight going backwards. I wasn't trying to constantly correct these little minutia things. I had my eye on the big picture. <coughs> so this week, I oh let me let me go back a little bit with that long view because we are here this morning because the people who came before us took the long view here at Alden United Methodist Church. as it is. For us, we stand on those people's shoulders. And so now we are those people who need to have the long view of where we are going. So this week, I have an assignment for you. You have homework from worship. I don't always give homework, but you know, I used to teach French at one time, so you get a little teacher thing. I want you this week to take some time with God, and I want you to write two letters. And I want you to bring them to church next week, along with your pledge cards, if you haven't brought your pledge cards in yet, um, and if you haven't had a chance to fill them in, and uh, that requires time with God too. Now, the first letter, I want you to write to yourself. Nobody else is going to see it unless you show it to somebody else. And I want you to write a letter to yourself a year from now. And I want you to put it in an envelope, address it to yourself, you can seal it up. I want you and God to have this conversation about how you want to grow closer to God and how you want to grow your faith life in the next year. And maybe even take a longer view to five years out. Um, there's going to be some more opportunities for that that you'll hear about next week. But I want you to have some things on there of ways you want to grow your faith, that you want to grow closer to God. And these are just things for you to be thinking about. Now, you can have some vague, vague things, like I want to spend more time in prayer, which, you know, people who tell you all the goals, all the, all the business goals and, and beginning of the year things that you should have all these, it should have a time and how and all that stuff. But you can have some vague things, like I just want to spend more time in prayer or I want to spend more time with Jesus. But I'd also encourage you to have some that are specific and measurable things like, I'm going to start reading a chapter of my Bible each morning with breakfast. And one year from now, about stewardship time, I'm going to mail those back to you and you will get to see how you've grown in your faith journey. Now the second letter I want you to write, and like these don't have to be terribly long, I want you to dream big dreams. dreams that you want to restart something you love that filled your soul or that you knew was a great ministry you can put that on there or maybe something cool 
people you heard about from a friend who their church is doing something cool, um, I'm perfectly okay with adapting and adopting other people's great ideas. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Or maybe you see a need for something in our church or community. Remember, we wrote some of those down in the last few weeks. But don't let, we've never done that before, which is the seven last words of the church, right? We've never done that before, or I don't see how we can make that happen. We don't have whatever it is to do that, whether it's people or resources, because my experience is when you are doing God's work, God shows up and provides those things. Or you can think outside of the box to figure out, you know, maybe if we want a choir, maybe we put it on the sign and ask people who wants to be in a choir and people will show up. And so I want you to think about how you are going to grow closer in your faith to God and think about how God can use you in the next year and think about ways you want to see our church being used by God in the next year. And I'm just going to remind you of this quote from Ted Lasso. But it is such a deep show. But he said when talking to his players, he said, don't bring an umbrella to a brainstorm. So I don't want you to bring an umbrella. I want you to think about all the things that God might have in store for us. Dream big dreams. And that, my friends, is where our reading from 1 Corinthians comes in today. Because that reading tells us that every person is given something to do that shows the world who God is. In the body, some of us are eyes and others are ears, some are hands and feet and teeth and noses, and some of us were belly buttons and nose hairs, right? <laughs> or maybe for you eye older guys, maybe your ear hairs, right? And so think about that. None of us are exactly the same, and each of us is unique in our own way. Even if you look at somebody's face, I know mine's a good example. My eyes don't match. They're not exactly the same, even though there's two of them, right? And so every one of us is an important piece of the puzzle. Every piece matters, and not one piece can get thrown away. That would be a horrible thing, is to find somebody with doing a puzzle and throw one piece away, wouldn't it? Oh. I am an evil, evil person. That is a horrible thought, right? To have one piece missing. Every piece of that puzzle is important. Just like the body is made up of different parts, the body of Christ is made up of different, all-important parts, too. But it takes all of us listening for God's still-speaking voice to follow our individual cause. Because God gives each of us gifts and passions that make us who we are, and when we share our true selves and the things that we love to do with one another, that's how we build up the church. So friends, I want you to take a minute and think about something you're good at. Think about something you're passionate about. It could be old cars, it could be knitting, it could be just about anything. Think of something you are passionate about. Are you a good storyteller or maybe you're a good listener? Are you organized? That would not be me. Or outgoing? Do you inspire others? Or maybe you're good at fundraising or have an ability to help others heal in mind or body and spirit. Well, they're not listed in the Bible as gifts of the Spirit, but I will tell you, those are all gifts of the Spirit. God-given gifts that are freely given to make you into the person you are. So my friends, each one of you here has a gift to share. Every person is an important piece of the puzzle, and there is not one person here that matters more or less than another. The most basic message of Christianity is one of resurrection and renewal. Paul wrote, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. As we wander out of COVID now in these kind of endemic COVID days, Let's go boldly and faithfully where God leads us. Amen. Amen.
All right, our closing chorus is number 114, Many Gifts, One Spirit. If you would rise as you are able. What? Oh, thank you. I skipped right past it. You guys can rise, but we're going to, well, you can rise because we rise for the doxology, right? But we are going to uh, bless our morning offering. <laughs> And I know I usually say it, but these are some good words from John Wesley. I think it would be great for all of us to say together. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever you can. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go with God. Go with God. Yeah. Okay. Okay.